America today, and indeed the world, is uh, coming out of the, the stress of the pandemic. Um, many people say we're, we're, all of us will suffer in some form for post-traumatic uh, uh, stress. With us is perhaps one of the world's mo uh, greatest authorities on it, Dr. Randall Bell. He's here to talk about about that in his new book, and I, for one, am really looking forward to hearing from him. Dr. Bell, welcome aboard. Well, Don, it's an honor and a privilege to be speaking with you. Thank you. Well, I think the honor belongs to us. But uh, tell us a little, first a little bit about your background, then a little bit of what you're doing in your new book, and finally a website where people can learn more. Well, sure. I uh, was uh, I grew up in Fullerton, California, a little town just north of Anaheim, where Disneyland is, and um, and uh, you know did the normal things and grew up, and um, eventually went to grad school at UCLA, and then uh, went uh, after that to earn a PhD in sociology. But my career is unique, Don, because I studied disasters. I've studied disasters for decades, going back to the 1980s. And uh, at this point, I've studied thousands of disasters. Every, uh, cases of mine include like the World Trade Center and uh, Flight 93 crash site, Hurricane Katrina, uh, the Bikini Atoll nuclear weapons test sites. I worked on OJ and John Bunny Ramsey and a score of uh, famous crime scenes. And I, uh, Don, what, what basically happened was I, I worked on these cases and I still work on them today as an economist but I get to meet the people behind the scenes, behind the headlines, and that's giving me some unique access. And I found that the people are far more interesting than the statistics. So it's been a passion of mine for years to you know, talk to these people and try and figure out, because what I've noticed is that in the aftermath of a disaster or in the, or in the aftermath of a tragedy, there's some people that die, the, the, the tragedy really takes them down. I'm not trying to be judgmental, but that's a sad reality. And then there's some people that survive, they get back on their feet and that's really admirable. But the people I'm most fascinated with are those who uh, thrive in the aftermath of a disaster. It's as if the tragedy kind of woke them up and woke up their spirit. And now that they're, they're just doing phenomenal things uh, with their lives. And um, so, for 10 years, I've been working on this book, doing enormous amounts of research. Um, I have a research firm, so I have a little army of people that you know look up the books, the articles, and all the academia of post-traumatic stress disorder and trauma recovery and, and those kinds of things. And uh, I came up with the title Post-Traumatic Thriving because that kind of describes um, you know, what can happen. When, it, when a tragedy happens, it doesn't necessarily need to take us down. You know, if we go through steps that prove, are proven by science, we, we will thrive. And then I interweave the book with a number of friends, uh, some who are very well known, but I, I know all these people um, who, uh, who are, are big time thrivers. So that's the, that's the elevator speech. Um, and my website is drbell.com. And I, I love the conversation about thriving and, and trauma recovery and healing and, and that kind of thing. Well, you've come to the right place to talk about it. Uh, I, um, having covered 14 wars, I've kind of looked at things. Uh, I always use the line from Jean, uh, Sean Analu's uh, uh, play, Tiger at the Gate, man's great um, uh, gift is he can look at tragedy at, from the terrace, in effect, let things go. But, but we're here to talk about you, but I guess my, when you say people thrive, uh, um, what is it uh, that triggers it that makes them thrive? Well, that's a great question, Don. I think the simplest way to put it is just a conscientious decision to say, hey, uh, you, you, the people that thrive, the, the common denominator is they work through the process. They don't try and do the classic mistake, um, which was a mistake I made with my trauma. I, had, uh, I was born with a congenital heart defect and I had open heart surgery when I was 11 years old. And that for a little, uh, for a little guy uh, was very traumatizing. So 
what these people do is they they don't stuff it down deep because when we do speaking of war we create an internal war when we ignore our trauma or when we try to uh, uh you know uh pretend it doesn't exist we heal when we talk about it we got to tell our story so one of the principles in chapter one of the book is what i call the dynamic duel one is what we call sitting in the fire that's finding a trusted person a fellow veteran a uh, therapist a good friend uh, even journaling but tell your story your story has to be told uh, as ugly as it might be as as uh, you know as as embarrassing as it may be telling our story is very very healing and the second of the dynamic duo is to is deep breathing exercises i've noticed over and over again people that thrive have some kind of we'll call it a meditative practice um, where it's not necessarily any kind of a religious issue. It's more deep breathing resets the brain chemistry because trauma, I go into the, the, the brain chemistry in the book and it's kind of complicated. I've tried to simplify it uh, with some nice charts and diagrams, but trauma uh, re, you know, does things to our brains. It rewires how we memorize or remember things. We actually have three brains. We have the outer brain, which is the human brain then the midbrain is the mammal brain where we feel emotion. And then the inner brain is the reptilian brain. So in the context of war or veterans, uh, when, when we're in combat and I once wandered, wandered into a combat zone, so I don't pretend I'm a veteran or, or anything like that, but I, I've, I've been there where there was machine guns going off on the other side of the wall and a bomb went off in uh, Jerusalem during a visit there. Um, it's very traumatizing, you're in shock. And that rewires the memories in the brain. Uh, but by deep breathing exercises, Harvard studies have showed, uh, I have over 20 Harvard studies that show that you can actually do brain scans and see the expansion of the brain and see the healing of the brain from those two exercises. But that's all to say, to go back to your question, the people that go through it kind of intuitively understand that uh, they've been through something with the shock and then the anger and then the denial and the bargaining. They usually land on depression, which is completely normal. Anger is completely normal. All those stages are normal. We just don't want to get stuck there. And so these post-traumatic thrivers don't get stuck there. They just kind of keep up with this progression. But you do that by, not by ignoring these stages, but by dealing with them head on and then keep moving up through the 15 stages of, of uh, trauma recovery. Well, you know, it's interesting. I, I've dealt with it all my life, and I've seen. Um, um, I, uh, I talked once with a, a general from uh, the Joint Chiefs, and uh, you may be aware in Vietnam they rotated people out individually rather than units, and they really felt that part of the problem was the fact that in World War II units rotated out, not individuals. And mm -hmm. people had the ability to share their, their common events. But in Vietnam, we did, uh, we did not do that. Um, and, it, and that's what he felt was one of the main, he felt there was a greater incidence of uh, trauma in Vietnam than in World War II. Oh. What do you say to that? Well, I, actually, Don, I didn't know that, and that's very, that's very interesting, and it reconciles well with the 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 process I go through with the book and my research because I, I would uh, say the same thing only a little differently is that trauma recovery is not a solo exercise. You have to accept the help of other people. So what you described is really brilliant because if you're if you feel alone, if you feel isolated. And there are people around you that can't relate to what you've been through. Uh, that keeps the trauma, you know, going. Um, so, I, frankly, in the second edition of the book, with your permission, I'll probably add that add that uh, uh, that comment because that's exactly right on the money. Uh, trauma recovery is a big deal. It's the difference between diving, surviving, or thriving, and. Um, and the more we can look at the science, and this is a big part of it, is is to accept help. You know, you know, you know, eat the humble pie. Accept help. A lot of us don't want to accept help. We want to 
you know, find it, figure out the directions for ourselves. We want to do everything. We, we can do it by ourselves. That's not the case with trauma. You, you've got to accept help from uh, the therapists, the friends, the comrades, um, the colleagues. Um, it, it's, it's, that's how we heal. I couldn't agree more. It's just, um, um, uh, uh, for instance, in the Civil War, if you want to go back that far, you, you may not be aware, but they demobilized um, regiments and companies together. Uh, but anyway, so that's something we can talk about. But but it still doesn't answer, I guess, uh, the real fundamental, to me, what is the fundamental question that you brought up. Some people survive it and thrive, and other people don't. They They fall apart and never, uh, how do you identify that if you can identify that? Yeah, it, 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 the, I'll put a little more meat on the bone um, with, with answering that. The, the studies into happiness, and which correlates with, with thriving, shows that 50% of happiness is our DNA. It's just what we're born with. Um, I happen to be lucky in that department. I was unlucky with the, with the uh, heart, heart condition, but I was lucky with the DNA. My mom said I was born smiling, but, but some people are, are not. Some people are more somber and more serious or, or, you know, or, de or depressed even. And, and that's totally normal. We're born with that DNA and there's nothing to be ashamed of. It is what it is. 10% um, of our happiness, believe it or not, just 10% are incidents that happen to us. So wh whatever that might be, whatever might traumatize us, that's 10% of our happiness. But here's the key, Don, is that 40% of our happiness, we do have control over. We can't, we can't affect, we can't change the 10% of things that happen to us. We can't change our DNA, but the 40% we can change. And the thrivers know that, in, intuitively know it. And that thing, that 40% are our activities that we choose. So in other words, the person who gets stuck in their trauma, they listen to you know, things that I've, I'm saying now, or they listen to other people that are saying the same thing. It all comes from the same body of science. And they say, oh, deep breathing exercises, that's interesting, but that's too simple. That doesn't work for me. You know, My trauma is too special um, and that won't help. Let me just say on that exercise, uh, baloney, um, you know, I do a lot of volunteer work up at San Quentin Prison in uh, Northern California, and uh, we have criminal criminals coming into the class. Uh, and after two years of what I'm talking about, they walk out the nicest, kindest gentlemen who have taken full responsibility for what they've done, who, um, who ha I've seen many times break down like babies crying over with remorse of what they did. And, um, and one of the big things there is every single session is started with what we call grounding exercises, which is another word for meditation or Lamaze or deep breathing or yoga. It goes by a lot of names. So the, the, the survivors and the thrivers really get that these principles work and they actually do them. And then they actually talk about it in terms of telling their story. We call that sitting in the fire again where the, we have these ugly conversations. So it may sound too simple to be true, but I've seen it with my own eyes. It's backed up by the science. And the real difference between those who get stuck and those who really move on and heal and have happy, productive lives really start with those two things. And I've seen it over and over again. Well, uh, I've never much believed in, in many of this stuff. I went through the Lamaz class uh, with um, my goddaughter many, many years ago, um, and, uh, at the end of it, she still got an epidermal, uh, dermal, uh, but that's another story. Um, well, well, let's turn this around. I'll, I'll give you an instance, which is a true story. Yeah. Uh, many years ago, when, when the, the, the flying had less restrictions, a, ma a man was in the Chicago airport about to board a first class seat to back to Los Angeles. His boss came along and said, said, my plane is two hours later. I have more important that I get there. 
He grabs a ticket out of the of my friend's hand for him and his wife, and gets on the plane. And as my my friend is watching the plane take off, it takes off and crashed. It was it's a famous crash at O'Hare Airport. You know that's fate. Yet I've ne- from that point on, uh, I've never said this other part of the story. I don't think he was ever the same again. Um, that to me is uh, stress of the highest order. Well, that's a pretty traumatic story, and um, and I've dealt with others. I've dealt with. Uh, I worked on the Sandy Hook school shooting and and other cases where people have seen horrific things, uh, like your. Like, like the story you shared and um you know going into the prisons you know these criminals these people who have committed you know horrible crimes and, and are offenders uh a lot of times 95 uh, percent of the time actually their childhood trauma is horrific i've heard stories that i couldn't even repeat they're just so horrific and um you know in terms of things that have, have happened to a lot of these people as children and then they act out. They don't process the trauma. They're, we don't. We're never taught this stuff in, in school how to do it. And then they uh, offend as an adult, and then they land in prison. Um, I can tell you, as in, as far as witnessing a plane crash, um, the the shootings. I've worked on several mass shooting cases. The case with the um, the Pulse nightclub in uh, Orlando, Florida, and others. <clears throat> the, these are all over the top horrific experiences but i gotta go back to you to what you said earlier don that you don't really buy into it you know in the book i have some simple exhibits on on meditation and deep breathing and you don't call it lamaze that's that's a different thing for well, yeah, women I, going I, childbirth try it out for a month and and i'll tell you you'll feel you'll feel the improvement I'm, I'm probably again i'm not arguing with you i'm just I, <laughs> uh, um uh, you, you, you're on this program because you're the expert. So, so uh, why don't I shut up and you tell us more about uh, your book and what p- people c- can get out of it. But first of all, your, the name of your book again and how people can get it. Yeah, the name of the book is Post Traumatic Thriving. Uh, it's a, on Amazon, it's on all the bookstores. And I am not doing this for the money. I'm doing this because I feel a personal responsibility that I've had this unique access to these disaster sites all over the world. I've been to seven continents, 50 states working on disasters for since 1986. So I don't know what that math adds up to, but it's, it's a lot of research. And, um, <clears throat> and, and you can visit me at drbell.com. But <clears throat> in post-traumatic thriving, there's 15 chapters, and if you like, Don, I'll go. I'll kind of give you a, a glimpse into all 15. Please, please. And you can, yeah, you can kind of see the process um, of how that works. The um, it starts with shock. Um, some disasters are chronic, and some are acute, meaning some kind of linger over time, like you're in an abusive relationship or you're in a war. It's day in day out, or some just come and hit you, like your friend who witness the uh, the plane crash. That's just uh, an instant that can change your life. It doesn't matter if it's acute or or uh, chronic. The, the solutions are the same. So chapter one starts off with talking about shock, what's going on with our blood cr- uh, chemistry, our brain chemistry, our adrenaline gland. And what basically happens, Don, is when we're when we go into shock, our human brain shuts off, our reptilian an instinct brain turns on and um it's a survival thing it's like how do i get you know to the right you know behind the tree to avoid gunfire or how do i um rescue my family out of a burning car it's just it's it's, it's instinctual and it's hard driving and the adrenaline is pumping out at massive levels so the thing is is that the trauma occurs it's it's an ugly picture i get that but in that post-traumatic time period, what happens is because our brain was not functioning normally, it was in this fight, flight, freeze mode of, um, of shock, that can stay with us. So the, the classic example is that the veteran is you know, out 
on the sidewalk, you know, walking down the street to a restaurant and they hear a car backfire and they hit the deck to, you know, because of that instinct, they've been triggered. So the idea with trauma, the big picture is we don't ever want to forget about it. That's, you're never going to forget about a war. You're not going to forget about an accident. You're not going to forget about the death of a loved one. That's not the goal. The goal is to go through the healing process so that when you're triggered the next time, that memory can flow through the mind harmlessly. And in other words, not turn on the brain system that triggers the adrenaline gland above our kidneys and pump out adrenaline. Uh, because living with adrenaline pumping through our bloodstream is not healthy. So that's the goal. So right now I can think about my heart surgery and I didn't do the healing for decades. I'd stuffed it down. Now that I've been through the process, I can talk about it and there's no adrenaline. There's no high blood pressure. There's no high pulse rate going through me, even though I'm talking about something that as a kid was very traumatic to me. So that's the goal with anybody dealing with their, their trauma. So it starts with, uh, you know, a chapter on shock. And, you know, it's kind of, a, you know, frankly, Don, it's kind of an ugly topic. You know, people don't want to go back and revisit the shock. It's not a happy memory, but that's what's necessary to do to heal. And then the next one is denial. After there's a, the next chapter is denial, meaning we try and forget about it. We try and deny it, it was bad as it was. We just try and bury that memory. And I, I was guilty of that big time of denying it and not talking about it. And then chapter three is anger. And a lot of people feel guilty over anger and they shouldn't um, because anger is a totally normal emotion. As long as you're not hurting someone else, as long as you're not hurting yourself, Anger is totally fine. And so I say in the book, if you're mad, be mad. If you're angry, be angry. It's a normal emotion to feel that. We just don't want to get stuck there. And so I have some tips in there how to kind of deal with anger. But the first step is don't be embarrassed about it. Be angry. But don't make everyone's life miserable about it and don't hurt anybody else. Um, I, then I, is, uh, bar to, yeah, go ahead, Don. Because... But, uh, here, trying to heal ourselves from, from the pandemic, we're not permitted to be angry about it. We're not permitted to, for instance, to be angry if you think that the Chinese created it or however it was. We're not permitting people to be angry about it. I think you're right, Don, and that's part of the problem. And that's why our trauma from the pandemic will probably linger longer than it should, because we should be angry. Uh, and there should be people held responsible or, or, or governments or whoever's ultimately found responsible. There, there should be that discussion. And you're right, a lot of people want to shut that down. That's a classic mistake. You want to talk about it and you want to process it. Okay. Yeah. Didn't mean to interrupt, but I want to make sure. Oh, no. Is a great comment. And then, and then the next step is bargaining. You know, when I was told I had to have heart, heart surgery as a 10 years old, uh, when I was told, um, you know, I bargained with my parents, I bargained with God, I bargained with the doctors, I bargained with the nurses, I bargained with anyone I could try and bargain with. And it, you know, frankly, bargaining can work sometimes, but for me, it didn't work. I still had to, you know, go into the hospital. And then ultimately, you land on depression where you're just you know, uh, down. The rule of thumb there, Don, with depression is that if it lasts for more than two or three months, you've absolutely got to seek help. Um, that's where we go back to what I said earlier about a solo exercise. It won't work. You, you've got to uh, seek help. And I did, and I'm not bashful about admitting it. In fact, I'm quite open about it because it worked. It, it, it helped me through that, um, you know, depression and, and kind of move on. So that's the that's section one of the book, those five stages. And we go into the detail, lots of ch charts and exhibits on how this all works. And we wanna kind of read a chapter and think about that stage so we can process through it you know, with our emotions. That's stage one. Stage two is survival. We've gone from dive to survive. The first thing to do to survive is really confront things. Um, like you were just saying, you know, confront who's responsible for this pandemic, confront your, your, your abuser, confront the, your leaders, confront whoever uh, caused 
or uh, facilitated the the trauma to happen um and and have some um you know enough self-respect that you don't bury it and pretend it didn't happen you you confront it that doesn't mean you become a jerk and start you know going off on people but there's a there's an honest discussion hey this happened and and um, I, I was traumatized and, and having those open conversations there's open and there's closed systems and there's open people and there are closed people we got to go from closed to open to really kind of have a healthy discussion and say hey you know let's talk about this and then the next one is kind of the, the title little. of the chapter is sort out it's basically you untangle the mess and you know maybe some good things happen from the war maybe some good things happen from you know a trauma uh, maybe there's some good things that you know in my case with my heart surgery so you know i i'm 62 years old and my heart's in great shape now so you untangle the the good from the bad and you kind of sort that out and then the eighth chapter is really kind of the most fun. It's exploration, where you explore different things. Maybe I ought to take up a hobby. Maybe I should start volunteering at the homeless shelter. Maybe I ought to um, you know, join a church or join a, a, a sports club or whatever it is. But you start exploring new things uh, to, get, you know, to get interested in. And then um, the next one is acceptance. That's just kind of the character. That whole chapter is about the character to hold yourself and hold others responsible. In other words, I, I might not be responsible for my trauma that happened to me, but I am responsible for taking charge and healing and doing the research and figuring it out so I can kind of move beyond it. And the final chapter 10 in survival is awareness. And that's just kind of a, a mindfulness that we have an inner strength that we didn't realize we have there. You asked a couple of times, what separates the divers from the thrivers? And, and one of those things is just a mindfulness that, hey, within me, I have this God-given ability to be mindful, to take charge of, of my life and to, um, and to kind of take, manage my own transformation rather than just being subjected to whatever happened to me so that's the survival stage so before i get into thrive any any thoughts uh, on that did that make sense to you don no but unfortunately we don't have a very short time left but we're going to make time for you so please go into thrive okay well the thrive stage starts with faith um that's a ticklish subject because some people are agnostic or atheists or theists and all kinds of thing but the studies show that those who have faith in something, a higher power in nature, in humanity, faith in something bigger than themselves, do well better than those who reject all faith. Um, so there's a chapter on that. Connection, connecting right the, with the right people, um, having, having, like you said with that brilliant story that you shared, having a group that, you, that really knows how you are. Um, forgiveness, there's a chapter on forgiveness. 13. The big myth there is we don't forgive and forget. We, we, we're not going to forget these things, but th that's, that's a lie that we're told. But forgiveness means, again, kind of giving some, a little bit of grace, a little bit of understanding, a little bit of empathy, empathy for the other side of the story, and just kind of coming to, to peace with that. Chapter 14 is on resilience. That's kind of a discussion on the ability to bounce back uh, rather than just uh, go flat. The, the 15th chapter, I'll just say real quickly, is gratitude. Of all things, it's gratitude. I'm not grateful that I had heart surgery, but I'll tell you, Don, I am grateful that when I see a kid in a wheelchair, I don't have to pretend what that kid went through. Um, I have deep empathy. I, I always get a tear in my eye when I see a kid struggling because I was that kid when I was 10 or 11 before I had my heart surgery. So there's something good that can come out in terms of being grateful, not so much that the trauma happened to us, but for the lessons that we learned and the, and the, and the opportunity to build a little bit of character around that. So that's the big picture real quick. That's a darn good seven. At least you know your su subject is very evident. We're talking Dr. Randall Bell. He's got a great book. Uh, uh, Dr. Bell, your book again and where people can get it. 
Yeah, it's post-traumatic thriving. And thanks for the compliment. I got notes I'm cheating from, but um, it's at uh, Amazon. It's everywhere, post-traumatic thriving and uh, read it. And the Kindle version is only 75 cents. I'm not trying to make money. I'm trying to help people process this stuff. So get it, read it, and then let me know what you, how it worked for you. Well, we, uh, I'm going to make one more minute. Well, how would you like to, what would you like to leave your audience with? You know, uh, you know, Don, I, I love the conversation. I, I, again, appreciate you having me on. And I guess in my minute, I'll just say that the number one problem on planet earth is unresolved trauma, the drugs and alcohol and workaholism and, and all that are symptoms of trauma. If we actually deal with the trauma, those other symptoms go away. When I volunteer in the homeless shelter, I don't, I don't pound on the people for being alcoholic or getting into drugs or any of that. I, I address the underlying real problem and that's their unresolved trauma. And then the other stuff just naturally goes away. By college age, 66 to 85% of everyone will have experienced a trauma. By the time they're my age or your age, everyone's experienced a trauma. We're not taught how to deal with this in school. So I'm trying to just make this conversation bigger and louder so that the world can just get better. We, we, we've been talking with Dr. Randall, Randall Bell, and we thank you so much for joining us. It's been one of the uh, my more pleasurable uh, experiences. Thank you. Thank you, Don. I really appreciate it.